we shall look at in our Bibles from the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 13. Romans chapter 7 verse 13. Romans chapter 7 verse 13. I read, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Now this passage brings before us the subject of sin. And in this case we will be looking at sin in relationship to the law. Many, uh, the few times when I have had an opportunity to, to speak to young people, if you asked them generally, whether you draw a column and you show them uh, the life where there is no law, and the life, another column showing the life where there is a law, and you tell them the things that would happen in a life where there is law, and in a life where there is no law, most of the time, if you ask them which life they prefer, they will respond almost in a chorus. Choosing life that has no law. Why? Because um, the same uh, time, if you ask um, adults, particularly those who are not believers, um, you give them a life that has no law and a life that has law, and you tell them to choose, the difference between adults and young people is that adults choose a life that has law, but they would like to make the law themselves to suit what they want. Uh, for, the, for the young people, they don't mind living without law because they think it is fun. You are not controlled, there are no restrictions, you do what you like, you get everywhere you want to go, and they seem to think that that is the life they want. For adults, um, they know that life needs to be controlled, but they want it to be controlled in a manner that they want, to suit their own interests. Now this proves to us what this passage is telling us about sin. Um, when we look at this, we'll be basically looking, uh, the first thing we look at is the law and sin. Because the Bible tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. And by that, therefore, it means if there is no law, there is no sin. And from what we are trying to explain here, uh, when there is a law and the law is disobeyed, then sin results from that. And when there is law and law is obeyed, there will be righteousness. When there is life, we are just living, and there is no law, there is no sin, because sin results from the law. And that's what we want to look at this evening. Now, from the passage we have read, Paul talks about, begins with a question, which is a connection from the previous passage. Did that which is good then bring death to me, he seems like he's debating with someone else or with another argument that seems to suggest that law brings sin. That his death, the condition upon which 
he becomes dead is caused by the law itself. But his argument here uh, is that did that which is good, and that which is good is the law, then bring death to me? And of course we know he says this is not possible. When he says by no means, it is impossible, it cannot be. That law brings sin. Now, when we look at this argument, it gives us the picture of asking ourselves, what is law or what is God's law? In this passage, we realize that the law is good and just. The law is good and just. In this case, we are talking about God's law. God has given us his law for a purpose. It is because of his love upon us that he gave us the law. As I've given an example about youth who like to live without law, uh, those of us, particularly those who are believers, would ask ourselves, what kind of life would we have lived if God never gave us his word? What Christianity would we be having today if it was a life that is free from any control, that God has not given any prescriptions on how we need to relate with one another and how we need to relate with him. So the existence of a law is an initiative of God as a love for his people. The fact that we are being told that when there is life without law, there is no sin, does not make it look like when law comes in, law brings sin. Because this is the argument that Paul has here. When Paul says, by no means, he's actually stating the fact that it is not law that brings sin into our lives. Instead, he goes on to explain in the following uh, passage how it is law that actually reveals sin to us. When we become, we come in contact with the law, the law condemns us. The law is meant to condemn us because it is the one that uncovers or unveils the failures in our lives. It will be impossible for any one of us to know whether we have failed to live according to God's standards if there was no law. Upon believing, the Christian dies through getting united with Christ in his death. And that breaks the chain of disobedience that existed from the time we came into existence. And when that chain is broken, there is still a tendency within us, which Paul tries to explain here, that gives us a propensity towards sin. And we only realize that it is sin because of the law God has given us. Because the law, when we come in contact with it, it arouses sinful passions and brings them to the fore and makes us to notice or realize them. The law, the law re reveals the nature of human sin. It defines it. It catalyzes it. It sparks the very reactions that the law itself is meant to condemn or punish. Unless there is law, we cannot know whether we are going, we are walking on the right path, or whether we are straying from the path the Lord has set before us. So the Lord has given us his word, which is the law, and which the Bible describes in the passage we have read, which is referred to, did that which is good. The one Paul is talking about as being good is that same law, uh, which is meant to enable us judge and uh, between right and wrong and give us direction in our moral conduct. It is a law that is good, and it's a law that is meant to enable us walk 
in the way that God has prepared for us. This law is the law that reveals sin in our lives. When we look at this passage, we realize that after Paul saying it is impossible that law is the one that leads to spiritual death, he says uh, it was sin producing death in me through what is good. Paul is ascribing to sin what belongs to sin. It is sin within us that provokes us to do things against God. It is sin within us that drives us to do things that are not pleasant before our God. It is sin within us that brings about unholiness. It is sin within us that enables us or leads us to transgress against God. Therefore, sin is that which pushes us in a direction to disobey God. And therefore, if there is anything that produces spiritual death in us, it is not the law that God has given us. It is actually the sin that is within us. Of course, the situation is worse for those who do not know the Lord. For them, sin rules. And sin is the master. And therefore, there is total disregard for God's law. For us, we know each one of us, especially for those who are believers, that if you met anyone any of these days and asked you, what is the most difficult problem in your life as a Christian? The most obvious answer is sin. That is something that any believer will tell you from day one. That the most serious problem is not joblessness, it is not poverty, it is not lack of this or that, it is always sin. And that is the very thing that will even drive a Christian to cry, and Christian to be in agony. Whether it is sin in his or her own life, or it is sin in the life of the people around him. So sin is a serious disease that has afflicted the human race. And it has its origin in what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. That all of us, at the time when we are conceived in our mother's wombs, we are conceived in sin. When we were born in this world, as people in our families and our friends celebrate the coming of an angel, we know that it's a sinful creature that has come into existence. And that continues to reveal itself as we become more mature, the sin matures within us. Unless God intervenes, sin is a deadly disease to the life of man. It is the one single thing that either may make a man stand or fall. For it is because of sin that God had to send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world and suffer the way he did, just because of sin. That's how deadly sin is. Sin is a disease whose only medicine is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. It has no cure. It has no other source of control. The only place that you can run to when you are afflicted by sin is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the other things we would like to look at is that sin causes spiritual death. Uh, 
we ask ourselves many questions and many times we have no answers of why a child would be brought up in a Christian family where the parents are reading the scriptures every day. The parents are praying for that child. The child has been taken to Sunday school at an early age and has been taught all sorts of doctrines from Genesis to Revelation. But still the child doesn't believe. It is a question that you will ask yourself many times because in the normal life, if a person is exposed to certain teachings, whether it is in school or in the family or elsewhere, they tend to change and ascribe themselves to that kind of teaching or tend to practice what that teaching says. But that has not been true of the gospel. That the gospel may be preached, but still the person who has been preached for for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, may still come out a sinner and sinning continually despite the preaching. This tells us how serious sin is. It, it is a disease that is deadly and a disease that eventually causes spiritual death such that no amount of preaching no amount of pleading, no amount of prayers can be able to enter the heart of a sinful person unless God intervenes. This is how serious sin is. Of all the diseases that man can talk about, which can be cured by medical doctors, by psychologists, and by all other specialists, it is only sin that none of those specialists can handle because it's a sin that afflicts everyone, including those experts. And therefore, the, the, the death that is brought about by sin is not physical death, but spiritual death. We see in, a, in the passage we have read that it was sin producing death in me. That's what Paul says, through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. And we have already said that which is good that Paul is describing here is the law. And therefore, the law comes in as a necessary instrument through which people can be able to realize that their life is steeped in sin. Apart from the law, we cannot know sin. Apart from the law, we cannot recognize sin. Apart from the law, we cannot be able to know whether we have gone against God. The third thing that we will look at in this passage is the last portion of that verse that talks about sin as being beyond measure. We are told that in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment, that is through the law, might become sinful beyond measure. Through the law, it is possible for sin to be revealed and to be known of what it actually is. The corruption of our nature can only be revealed through the law. The sinful natures that we carry can only be known through God's law. How pure God's law is, is revealed when we come in contact with it, when we measure our lives against God's standards through God's law. And in this case, we are being told that it is through that commandment 
that we can be able to know how exceedingly sinful sin is. Sin was meant, as we have already said, for man's good. And therefore, it works, the law was meant for man's good, and sin works against man's good. Sin is always working in contrary to what God wants and what is in the best interest of man. This is evident in our practical life and is evident from God's word. Sin makes us exceedingly guilty and it makes us dishonoring to God. It has been a cause of so much suffering in the life of man, particularly by separating him from his creator. It has made man hate his creator. We have already said that whenever something crops up in our lives, we do not want to look at that thing in the light of what God wants. Why? Because of sin. Sin has driven us so much far from God that we have, to that extent, have to hate what God says. It has acted like poison in our lives and eaten everything good in us. That we are told that every imagination of the heart of man is evil continually from Genesis chapter 6. It is because of sin that our thoughts and our words and our actions are not pleasing before God. It is sin that has penetrated our being that God has had a problem and separated himself from us. We know that the separation that exists between man and God is only because of sin. Sin has corrupted every part of our being, that whether it is our hands or our minds or our feet or our lips, left on their own, we only go in the opposite direction of what God wants. There is no part on the human body that is inclined towards godliness. If God tells us to go east, the human tendency is to go west. If God tells us to come down, the human tendency is to go up. If God tells us to follow him, our tendency is to go from where he's coming from. The reason is sin. And that's why we are saying sin has made man a fool of himself. It has depraved man's understanding and made him a fool, ignorant, and sometimes acting as a beast, as we are descri is described in Psalm chapter 73, verse 22. Folly is the other name of sin. And so, fools is the other name of sinners. The foolishness that comes into our lives and why we, are, we can be counted to be fools is because sin has darkened our understanding. One example we can cite from the scripture is the story of the prodigal son. When we look at this son, this is a son who has been born in a family where he's loved by a responsible father. The family seems to have abundance of things. Then foolishness creeps into the mind of this boy. And he says he wants a share of his wealth to go to a far country and squander it. At first, it doesn't look like a very foolish idea because it is not clear what he's going to use that share that he's asking for. 
But when we follow him where he has gone, we find that sin is real foolishness. Because the man spends all his wealth squandering it in the streets. And within no time he has nothing. All we find is that he's now feeding in the same trough with pigs. He's sleeping in the cold while there is enough shelter at his home. He's eating dirty food while there is enough food in his home. He lives that life until when the scripture tells us that he came to himself. And that phrase of coming to himself implies that the foolishness flew out of him. That gives us the picture that this man was actually a fool. And that's the picture of any sinful person. He lives a life when he thinks he's having fun, while he's actually destroying himself. The offer of a return to the Lord is plenteous. The Lord has opened his arms. He's crying to him. He's pleading, come to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But the man continues to labor. The man continues to carry his burdens. He continues to increase his burdens. He continues to make himself suffer. He continues to drown himself in sin. That's how foolish sin can make someone to become. The other thing we see from this passage is that sin can drive a man into madness. In our own description of a mad person is the one who is unable to, who is not in control of himself or of his mind. Now, the Lord Jesus himself says, you will come to me that you may have life. And then he says, you will not come to me that you might have life. John chapter 5 verse 40. While all this is being said, and all the consequences of disbelief are shown to this person, and the clear demonstration that there is a life in Christ, a life eternal, is shown to the person. The person is so unreasonable. He simply says no to Christ and yes to sin. That's how mad sin can drive one. Sin acts and makes someone act out of the ordinary. You look at a sinful person doing what he does, speaking what he speaks, thinking the way he thinks, and you ask yourself, why does he have to think the way he does? Why is he doing it the way he's doing? Why is he talking the way he's talking? It gives you a picture of someone who is totally out of his mind. Yet that is the result of sin. Sin is exceedingly sinful. All of us are exposed to sin in one way or another. It is not because sin is external to us. Sin is internal to us, even those who are believers. Sin is around us. Sin is looking for an opportunity at any time to make us fools of ourselves, to make us look like we have run out of our minds, to make us profane the name of Christ. Sin is all around us. It is a danger that is ever living, ever present. And we have no other way of dealing with sin except the only way that is provided in the Bible. When we look at this passage, we find that at the point when we come in contact with God's word, that is the point 
at which Christ has started extending his mercies towards us. The tendency to turn away from God's word is very high. The temptation to disobey is very high. But then we are urged again and again to pay heed to what Christ says. Because he's the only medicine man. He's the only physician. He's the only who carries the medication that can actually treat us from this ever-living reality of sin. Those who have tasted of the goodness of Christ would be able to tell you how much Christ has done in trying to eradicate sin in their lives. But still they are not out of danger yet, for sin still abounds around us. And we all need the grace of Christ for us to be able to conquer this danger called sin. So as we come to a close, it is my prayer to us all that we pay heed to all the avenues that Christ has provided in his word through which we, must, we might be able to conquer sin. We are urged to pray. There is no account of any person who has been able to conquer sin on his own. Sin is conquered by Christ himself. And the only way you can get Christ into this battle is by praying. So unless we pray, we cannot defeat sin. We are urged to read and meditate upon God's word. And this we need to do prayerfully, diligently, and daily. We are not to be Christians of reading God's word when it's convenient. We are not to be opening our Bibles when we are preparing for the Sunday service. We are not only to open the scriptures when we are in a Bible study class. We are supposed to be ardent students of God's word. It should be our habit to spend serious amount of our time reading God's word. For we have already seen from this passage that it's only that word that reveals sin and that can enable us to be able to conquer that sin. It is also through the assembly of God's people and the company that we enjoy as believers that we can be able to conquer sin. It cannot be in vain that God commands us to come together as a local church. For it will still have worked, if it were possible, for God to tell each one of us to pray on his own and read his Bible in his home. The fact that God commands us to come together the way we do shows that it has a great purpose in helping us to conquer sin. Because the whole purpose of this life is that we may be able to overcome. And we cannot overcome by our own means. We don't have the arsenal. We don't have the tools. We don't have the strength to be able to defeat sin. Sin is a deadly disease, and the cure is with Christ. Christ has given the prescriptions of what we need to do. And it is a challenge to all of us that as we go to our homes, we consider that we are a prayerful people, that we are ardent students of God's word, and that we seriously take the assembly of God's people as instruments of fighting sin and making us holy and acceptable before God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent from heaven to come on earth and die. The purpose for which you died was because of sin. And Lord, we know that unless we believe in him, we have no life. This life is wasted unless Christ brings meaning into it.
Sin has deprived us of happiness. It has deprived us of peace. It has deprived us of true joy. And the only way we can be able to regain inner peace within ourselves, with fellow men, and with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, grant that this may be true for each one of us, that we may not be driven into the direction of madness, of foolishness, because of sin. Help us, Lord Father, that we will trust and wait upon the Lord, that we will not believe in ourselves, that we will not live a carefree life, that we will know that we have a serious battle in our hands, that we will not lose hope, Lord, that even at the time when the battle becomes fierce, that we will not put the trust in ourselves, but we will entrust everything to the Lord. May you make us humble before you. May you enable us to trust in you. May you enable us to follow you. May you enable us to stick to that which you have revealed to us through your word. Thank you for your love that you have demonstrated to us by giving us your word. Let us be people who are ready to meditate upon this word day and night, to think about it, to ponder it in our hearts, to rehearse over it, to read it again and again, to derive meaning out of it, to feed upon it as our necessary food, that, Lord, your word may fashion our lives in preparation to the coming of Christ. That your word may help us, Lord, to conquer sin. That your word may cement our relationship with you. That your word may guide us in godliness. Have mercy upon us this evening and grant, Lord, that your name may be honored in our lives. In Jesus' name I believe and pray.